All right, we are continuing our series on uh, Eats with Sinners. We're, we're, we're talking about trying to reach out to lost people like Jesus reached out to lost people. And as I was preparing for this message, I came across this story. In 1992, a Christian couple from Waco, Texas, along with a student from ba ba Baylor, spent time together getting to know the homeless population that slept under uh, a, a bridge uh, on Interstate 35. And for the next few months, they, uh, the men got to know them and finally accepted an invitation to meet them for a Bible study on Sunday mornings at the bridge. Over weeks and months, the small group grew to include more homeless folks, other lo lower income people, the local community who uh, did not go to church or didn't feel like church was uh, uh, ready to welcome them in. And they continued to grow and they continued to grow and they, they met basic needs of those in their congregation through shared resources. Within a couple of years, the, the Bible study group realized that God was, was doing something more than just a Bible study. Thus, the church under the bridge was born, and this year, they celebrate their 28th anniversary. 28th anniversary. Right now, people are still meeting. They're not meeting under the bridge anymore, but they're meeting nearby the bridge, still coming to church, still sharing the same message and same mission. You know what? All Christians are called to bring the church to the people because all Christians are the church. Where am I taking the church to the people? Where, are, where am I seeking out lost people, hurting people, people who are lonely, people who are caught up in the depths of sin? What am I doing intentionally to shine out into the darkness of my world? These were some of the questions I began to ask myself and I wrestled with this week as I tried to prepare this sermon. So much of my time and my energy and my thought life has been focused on how to bring more people in. How can we attract people to the church? What things can I do better to get the word out? None of those things are a bad thing, by the way. But they probably aren't the best thing. As we talked earlier in this series, we've been called to go. We've been called to seek and save. We, we, we've been called to go out and search for lost souls and, and, and bring them with us back. But, but we're supposed to be the ones going their direction. Aaron Chambers said this in the book. He said, we selfishly look at our own interest when we expect lost people to come worship with us, but never expect saved people to go and eat with sinners. Today, I want us to add to our evangelism arsenal. Today, I want us to add to all the things we've been looking at so far. I want to add to that group of things, connection connection. Now what I mean by connection, you could, you could translate it many different ways. Connection you could talk about being, you know, friendship or connection could be defined as closeness or connection could be defined as intimacy. But what I'm really meaning is relationship. How are we connecting with the lost in relationship? Think about how that might change our view of our mission. I'm not here just to declare or preach the truth. I am there to get to know others. I'm, I'm, there to, I'm, I'm here to go out and find people who need to know Jesus. I'm here to connect with lost souls. How can I show them Jesus if I don't know them? How can I show them if I don't know them? So how do we connect with lost people? How do we form relationships that change eternities? Now, I'll be quite honest with you. I don't have all the answers to this at all. I, I, I just wanted you to understand. 
I don't know how we do this completely, but I do know from Jesus' example some of the things we need to do to do that. And that's what I want us to look at. So if you have your Bible, turn me to Luke chapter 5. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, verse 27 through 32. This is what it says. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Jesus is the perfect example for our lives. We, we pattern our lives after him in, in all areas. But he's also the perfect example in how to connect with others, how to, how to build relationships and what that looks like. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do today. I'm encouraging you, to, encouraging you to follow his lead. And the very first thing we need to see is that connection is proactive. Connection is proactive. It is so easy for us to overlook or ignore this fact. It's easy for us to overlook that. But Jesus initiated the relationship with Levi, also known as Matthew. He initiated the relationship. Now, I want you to understand, as he's walking by the tax collector's booth, he's not walking by someone and thinking, man, they'd be a great addition, you know. They, they could give a lot and do things. The, the tax collector was hated. The tax collector was unpopular. The Jewish people couldn't stand the tax collector because the tax collector worked for the Roman government. They didn't like the Roman IRS. <laughs> but Jesus initiates contact Anyway, and he says to Matthew, Levi, come join me. Come join me. This seems to be a lost art. How many people have worked years at a job waiting for someone else to bring up the subject of Jesus? They, they know someone's lost, but they're, they're waiting for the right opportunity to present itself. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes you just need to make the opportunity. You need to be the one just initiate the opportunity. We'll go through high school. We'll go through college. And we never mention to those group of friends that we hang out with every day, we never mention Jesus. We never share him. Instead of being proactive, we are essentially inactive. Well, I'm waiting for the right time, Todd. I'm waiting for the right time. But you know what? The right time is right now. That's the right time. Right time is now. Well, you know what, Todd? I'm winning them through my actions. You know, I'm doing the right kind of things with my life. Well, that's great because actions are a powerful foundation for the message that you need to tell them. Yeah, your actions need to be right, but so do your words. In fact, I think we need to have the attitude that Paul had. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. He says, I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. Paul says, I can't, I have to do it. I have to share the good news. I've got to tell people about Jesus. Colossians 4, verse 5 and 6, we've mentioned it before. I want to mention it again. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There is an opportunity there that they are looking for. And what does he say to do with that opportunity? He says, have a conversation. <laughs> Speak up. Tell them, tell them about Jesus. I read a story about a man who gave his life to Jesus. 
He was a young adult. He was excited. He was telling everyone for the first couple weeks, he was telling everyone he could talk to about what Jesus has done in his life. One Sunday night, he was at a worship service, and they began to sing this song. Here's the song. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, weep over the erring one, bring them to Jesus, tell the poor sinner that Jesus can save. He heard the song. And he was so excited. As soon as the service was over, he ran up to the preacher and he said, Preacher, I'm ready. The preacher didn't know what he was talking about. Ready for what? The man says, I'm ready to go and rescue the perishing. Let's do it. And the preacher looked at him and said, Well, that's not something we really do. It's just something we sing about. That's a song. It's just a song. Just lyrics in a song. Listen, we, we cannot let rescuing lost people become something we would sing about rather than actually practice. We've got to get proactive and initiate relationships. You know, the longer you're in the church, the less people outside the church you have a relationship with. That's kind of, kind of how it's going to go. So what do people who've been in the church for years and years and years, what are they supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to go out and find places to make relationships. We've got to be proactive. It's the first thing. Jesus was proactive. The second thing is connecting means investing time. Investing time. Now, Jesus had this vibrant ministry going on, preaching and healing and providing hope for people. And in the midst of all this business, he calls Levi to come, Matthew to come. And all of a sudden, there's... This party invitation. Levi says, oh, yeah, I'm following. And by the way, Jesus, I want you to come to a party at my house. I'm going to invite all my friends, all these people that, at least from the Jewish perspective, are way outside those you should be hanging out with, way outside that. Now, think about it. Jesus could have easily said, you know what? I'm preparing a message for tomorrow, Levi. I just, I just can't be up that late that night. I, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I would love to come, but people are expecting to see me tomorrow, and they're expecting some miracles to be performed, and I need to, need to get a good night's rest so I can, so I can do them effectively. Levi, why don't you have your people call my people, and we'll get something in the works. We'll, we'll put something on the calendar. He could have done that. Jesus could have done that. But the interesting thing about Jesus is he has many priorities. We find Jesus, first of all, he makes a priority out of prayer. He goes out and he spends time with God speaking to him in his ministry. That's a great thing we ought to all do. One of the other priorities we see in Jesus' life is that he always makes time for lost people. He just always does. He always makes time for lost people. Remember the second greatest commandment? You're familiar with it. Matthew 22. I'm going to put it on the screen. Matthew 22, verse 39. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. I remember the first one. We heard it last week, by the way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, depending on which version you're looking at. Second one, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Spend, spend time with them. Invest in your neighbor. Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, it says, Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are not. You are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. None of us are that important. But someone else shouldn't take our time. That someone else shouldn't have our ear found some statistics that came from Lifeway Research. They're a few years old now. I'm not sure how many. I kind of lost track. But in their research, they found that unchurched adults who were interested in finding a church home were not very likely to actually just show up at a worship service. So they did this survey. They found out that, that unchurched people who were even interested in finding out about Jesus we're not that excited about just showing up at a worship service in person. However, in the survey, they found out that the unchurched people 
were often open to relationships. They, 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 were, they were willing to be in a relationship with a Christian and find out some more that way, but they weren't necessarily too excited about just showing up to find out what the church is all about, what worship service is all about. Now, sadly, they went on and they found some other statistics, and these are the, the sad part of these statistics. They said that uh, few church members are intentionally investing time developing relationship with non-Christians. In fact, only 25% of church members profess to spend time building friendships with non-Christians for the purpose of sharing Christ with them. Out of all the Christians, 25% said, we're actively trying to do that. Here's what really struck me. 38% actually disagreed with the statement as if they shouldn't do that. What? They shouldn't reach out to lost souls. They shouldn't try to make a difference. They shouldn't invest their time in people. That's exactly what we should do. Invest our time in people. Jesus is proactive in his connecting with others. Jesus is investing himself in the lives of others, and we go on. Connection comes at a personal expense. Connection comes at a personal expense. What happens as soon as Jesus starts hanging out with those people who actually need him to hang out with them? Well, the religious leaders of the day start to ridicule him and resent him and tear him down and try to attack him and deride him. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus knew all that was coming. Jesus knew it was coming. In fact, when he took on flesh, he knew that this is not going to be a walk in the park. There was going to be a great personal expense for him. He was going to give his life to save lost people. If Jesus could give his life to save the lost, surely we can take a little bit of ridicule. Surely we can take people coming against us and taking pot shots at us because we're out there hanging out with people who need Jesus. Surely we can take someone smearing our character and our reputation or claiming that we are selling out or undermining our ministry or trying to reject us. Surely we can put up with that because Jesus went to the cross for me. Surely I can do those things. Matthew 11, verse 19 the Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Now look at this text, and to be quite honest, I, I probably fit into the glutton part, but the point is, are we intentionally building relationships with others, with lost people, even if attacks come. Who cares if attacks come? Would you rather have people speak good about you or God speak good about you? 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15, But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks you your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Don't fear their threats. Just keep on witnessing and sharing Jesus with those that are lost. That's what Jesus does. And then one last thing about what Jesus does to connect with people is that connecting is our calling. Connecting is our calling. Jesus, when they start complaining about who he's hanging out with, Jesus compares his calling, and by the way, our calling by extension, he compares it to being a doctor, a doctor who is treating sick people. He, he says, that's, that's, I'm, the, I'm a spiritual doctor. By the way, he was a He's a great physician. He could have done whatever. But what, I, what, I'm, what he points to is a doctor caring for sick people. Me and Sue's have been to a lot of doctors in the last few years. A lot of them. A ton of them. You know what makes a good doctor a good doctor? And we've got a bunch of those, a bunch of good doctors in our 
in our life. You know what makes a good doctor a good doctor, in my opinion? They care enough to listen to what you're telling them. They care enough to listen to what you're telling them. They don't have to know every single condition a person could possibly have in their life. They can start to research that, start figuring that out, start talking to someone else about that. But when they listen to you and they pay attention to what you're telling them, it makes a huge difference because their calling is to try to bring about health in your life to the best of their ability. That's what you and I need to do. We need to get out there and listen to people so we can bring about better health in their life. I heard a story about a doctor, and I wonder sometimes if we aren't like this doctor, or at least I'm not like this doctor. The doctor had huge success. I mean, he was really bringing in powerful numbers as far as a doctor is concerned. He had not that many patients, but all of his patients just kept remaining remarkably healthy. I mean, it was, it was powerful. A journalist heard about this doctor, and he decided to pay him a visit. Now, the journalist was a man by the name of McKenna. He suffered from this rare blood disorder. Now, most of his life, he lived normally, but if he didn't watch his diet carefully, he could go into a coma and if, and, and, and for a few days or worse, and, and, and the illness could easily take his life. So he's looking for a cure, and he heard about this doctor. And so he went to this doctor hoping to get some help, went to the doctor's office, asked for an appointment. The nurse asked him to fill out a form. All the questions seemed pretty usual, pretty standard. But then there was a strange question on the form. The form asked whether or not he had any potentially fatal diseases. And, of course, McKenna answered that he did. He finished finished up filling the form out, handed it back to the nurse. The nurse looked at the form for a moment, then informed McKenna that the doctor's appointment book was full that day. And tomorrow it was full, and the next day it was full. In fact, the doctor could not see him at all, not now, not ever. He thought that was odd. His journalistic instincts made him a bit suspicious, so he arranged for a friend to come and make an appointment. The friend was in perfect health, and he said so on the form. And he handed the form back into the nurse this time, this friend did, and the doctor was able to see him that very afternoon. See, the doctor's secret was out. He had a good record because he only saw healthy people. He only saw healthy people. Listen, let me ask you a question. If you're going through your week and you're only ever seeing healthy people, then you're not being the doctor you've been called to be. And neither am I. Our call is to seek out sick people. And bring them to the great physician. But so often we spend so much time and energy hanging out with healthy people that we forget that we're supposed to be doctors. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, it says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Amen to that. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We're it. We're the ambassadors. We're the mouthpiece. We're the people going out, and we're supposed to be sharing with a a hopeless, sin-sick world that they can be redeemed, that they can be transformed, that they can be forgiven, and that they can be gods. That they can be gods, not God's but God's possession. Let me clear that up. Brendan Manning writes, well, he was the writer of the Ragamuffin Gospel, but he proclaims this. He said, Here's a a revelation bright as the evening star. Jesus comes for sinners, for those as outcast as tax collectors, and for those caught up in squalid choices and failed dreams. He comes for corporate executives, street people, superstars, farmers, hookers, addicts, IRS agents, AIDS victims, and even used car salesmen. (laughs) Jesus not only talks with these people, but he also dines with them, fully aware that his table fellowship with sinners will raise the eyebrows of religious bureaucrats 
who hold up the robes and insignia of their authority to justify their condemnation of the truth and their rejection of the gospel of grace. Let's be like Jesus, not like religious bureaucrats. Brothers and sisters, we, we've been called to go out to the sin, sinner, those that are needing Jesus, and bring them back. Go and share our life. Being proactive, paying whatever cost, getting in relationship with them, sharing our life with them. We've been called. We've been called. Will you choose today to make that move? That's the question. Will, will we choose to invest our time and risk our reputation? Will we choose to accept our calling? And will we keep this life-saving news going out to the lost, or will we keep it to ourselves? As I studied through this sermon, through this text, I, I continue to get convicted and convicted and convicted. And if one last scripture I want to read to you. It came to my mind, and it really powerfully stuck with me. It's Matthew chapter 10. This is what Jesus says. He says, everyone who acknowledge me, acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Let's be those people out there telling others about Jesus, acknowledging him before everyone we can. Let's not be those ones that stay silent. We pray with me. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we come right now. I, I come really, to be quite honest, kind of overwhelmed by this text. Realizing that, that connection, intimacy, relationship, fellowship, th 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 those are important ingredients for me to reach out to those who don't know you. And Lord, Unless I'm intentional, unless each one here is intentional, we're, we're, we're getting less and less relationships that we can do that very thing. Father, I pray that you will open our eyes to all of the opportunities around us. I pray, Lord, that we will stop waiting for things to happen and start initiating them. Lord, I pray that we will pay the price, that we will give the time, and that we will share the good news. Lord, as we gone through this sermon this morning, maybe, maybe, maybe someone was laid on someone's heart, maybe they were thinking about it, maybe a, a name came, a face came, whatever that is, whoever that was, I, I pray, Lord, that they will step out and tell them about you. I pray all of us can be those people who are the under-the-bridge church and the at-the-work break room church and a during the class church, and wherever we are, church, so that people can know about your son and about the love you have for us. Lord, we come laying our lives before you and asking, uh, asking you to help us to be the people you've called us to be. Help us change lives. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.